that it is proper that man should regard the body as the instrument of his purpose, that he should be kind to it, guard it, take care of it, and preserve it by his own reason from any excess that will injure it. But if his own reason and his own emotions themselves are addicted to excess, then he works a terrible hardship on his body, bringing it down to ruin and bringing with it the ruin of his inner life. Thus the importance that man's leadership shall be complete, but always benevolent. He must then, according to the golden verses, realize always that to the degree he grows, he becomes a paternal or maternal being. Growth is always in the direction of parenthood. Growth is never in the direction of autocracy. Now, many persons Im imply that parenthood is an autocracy, and that is one of the tragedies that has burdened homes for thousands of years. The belief that the parent is by divine right the master and proprietor of his family. This is not true. The parent by divine right is the good shepherd of his family, always. He is the one to whom that family has a right to turn for protection and for understanding. The obedience given to the parent is given not to a person, but to the principles for which that parent may stand. And Socrates probably paid with his life for telling his disciple that a wise son should instruct his father and that the mere physical relationship of father to son does not permit the father who is ignorant to dominate the son who is wiser. But it is the natural desire of parenthood to lead, to lead constructively and benevolently. But parenthood is not limited to physical things, but it is an attitude, it is a concept. The moment an individual knows more, he is more patient. The person who knows more is best able to estimate the circumstances behind the weakness of others. And these circumstances, if understood, cannot lead to condemnation. We may advise, we may try to help, but it uh, speaks very clearly in the Golden Verses that the wiser person the adjusted person, the discriminating person, is not presumed to lock himself in endless conflict with others. Nor is he to judge them. Nor is he to condemn them. He is to understand them. And this is the blessed privilege, for as much as the parent is indulgent with the small child, knowing that that child must pass through certain experiences, so the wise scholar is indulgent with those less informed than himself, realizing that they are children, or less mature than himself, and therefore in need of his love and affection and his intelligent guidance, not in need of heartlessness, criticism, condemnation, or rebuke alone. Thus by wisdom we gain patience. And by patience, all good things become possible. There is no substitute for it. By wisdom also we gain charity. And charity is not merely the sharing of goods. It comes from the Greek charitas, which means love. It is the individual giving of his own understanding. Giving of what he is, not merely of what he has. All these points are made in the Golden Verses simply because they are part of the process that frees discrimination from the tyranny of sense. Now, most persons are much more interested in advanced studies. They want to go on to very involved doctrines. And here Pythagoras, perhaps of all the great teachers, uh, would not accompany them. He insisted that it was useless and valueless 
to attempt to develop special faculties of consciousness until the ordinary part of man was put in order. That we must build upon the firm foundation of achievement in small matters. That we must grow sequentially. And that we shall never discover anything that will cure our dispositional problem except our own effort. We can never intellectually advance far enough to get out of our human problem. The only way we can solve that problem is to meet it and correct it. The only way we can gain this liberation is through this retrospective process of studying ourselves. Now very often this kind of study has a drawback. And this drawback is more common to us because, as we have said, the modern world is rather different from antiquity in its attitude toward life. The Pythagorean disciplines belonged to a way of life in which man had certain definite values which are more or less absent in our contemporary pattern. Pythagoras lived in a world of people who were essentially simple people. He lived in a world in which man's religion was a very simple and naturalistic ritual. In those days there was not much fear in religion, nor was there the pressure of confusion of sect and belief which we know today. The Greek and Italian states had their native religion. Most persons followed it. Some attempted to interpret it but a common faith held all men together. Also, there was a great and definite tendency to admire the philosophic life. Religion and philosophy led the public mind. Those who attained in these fields were regarded as the outstanding citizens. Thus the drift or trend was toward these matters, whereas today the drift and trend is not toward these matters and the individual does not have the common strength of a natural simple faith which was founded in the belief in good and that things which were natural, fine, orderly, sequential and kindly were good. Not having this common strength today, not having this simple foundation upon which to build, we have more confusion in our ways than perturbed the ancient. At the same time, we have greater opportunity, for the greater the problem, the greater the victory. One of the primary virtues is not to be exploited, but it is to attain this end by reason, by judgment, by integrity. I believe there was a comedian here, W.C. Fields, some years ago, who pointed out that you cannot cheat an honest man. And it is very difficult, because the honest man does not expect a bargain. And nearly all trouble begins when we try to get something for nothing. From that moment on, we are ready to be exploited, because our own attitude is actually an open invitation to the dishonesty of others. And we will ultimately find someone who will take advantage of us. If, on the other hand, we expect nothing we do not earn, we have discrimination in matters of quality, we have foresight not to permit ourselves to become involved in situations we cannot control, and little by little we have ordered our own lives, we are going to be very, very hard to cheat. The individual who, forgetting himself, bestows his total life upon others is likely to be a greater burden than a help. And the person knowing not what to do, helping others to do it, only compounds the confusion. The blind lead the blind and all fall into the ditch together. Therefore the first duty of a leader is to make sure that his own eyes are open. And in order to have them open, whether it be in the simple leadership of home and family, or in the greater leadership of nation or race. 
the leader must have internal resources greater than his followers, or he is not justified in leading them. And these resources must be good. They must be resources founded in virtue, guided by wisdom, moderated by reason and judgment, and given constant vitalization by the impulses of virtue and truth. When these things are present, then good results, and the individual finds his growth and his natural way of life constantly enriching. This the Pythagoras pointed out again, that the Pythagorean way of life was not for everyone at any given moment. He could not cause the individual to come into those emergencies of life by which decision is necessary. He could only point out that once the individual has determined to improve himself, it can be accomplished. If, therefore, the individual, coming in his own due time to that maturity of insight, which makes him realize that improvement is necessary to survival, only that individual is ready for the philosophic life. And having made this dedication, he can then proceed as far as his own t integrity will sustain him. And he will go as far as his insight will sustain his determination to succeed. This was called the philosophic few, that group that had reached the point where it had suddenly realized that its trouble was due to itself. The world was undivided into two parts, the one the larger part being composed of persons who blame others. They are the unphilosophic material. Then there is the smaller group that recognizes self-responsibility for the consequences of conduct. This is the smaller group ready for greater insight. And those who had this insight could be led along that, the road of wisdom and could make that journey which leads finally back to our eternal home. The, reward, the rewards of discipline, then, are the gradual uh, integrations of the factors of living so that at last we can sit down quietly and say to ourselves with full meaningfulness, that we live in a good world, that we are surrounded by people who are essentially good, whose conduct that has long offended us is the result of the same circumstances that impelled our conduct which so long offended them, that we are all moved by the same non-tranquillities, and that by patience and growth we have grown, and that by patience and growth they will grow. We are there to help them, but only to help them to help themselves, for no man can grow for another, and no man can save another. But by example, we can invite others to the contemplative way of life. Having gradually reached this integration in ourselves, we come to the end of conflict. We are no longer bowed down by the opinions of others. We no longer cater to their weaknesses. We no longer subscribe to their superstitions. Rather, we live quietly, respecting all things, and serving mostly, and with all our contrition of spirit, that which is essentially true. Thus we come to what might be termed the fulfillment of the cathartic discipline of purification. We have removed impurity from ourselves. For all negative emotions, all uh, negative thoughts are impurities. All things which are not toward the good are away from the good. And that which is not for truth is against truth. And that which brings misery to ourselves and sorrow to others is not for the truth nor can we practice it with good grace, even though it be a dogma or doctrine of our time. We must be superior to these things 
But we find that dogmas and doctrines are man's